This is the Centurion. It's actually one of the prototypes. It's the oldest Centurion in existence, I would say. Please remember to like, subscribe, or click the little notification bell if you don't want to miss out on these videos. And I'd just like to say thank you to all our patrons for making this possible. Please join them if you can. Now, to begin with, the, the prototypes had a narrower track than the um, production version, the Mark I, and it was 20, well, about 20, 21 inches instead of 24 inches. This tank has actually been put onto the wider tracks. But to start off with, they were just that little bit narrower, if that makes any difference. The suspension, which was actually devised by Horseman of Vickers, was then amplified by Rackham of AEC. And um, it's like a Horseman suspension. You've got pairs of wheels acting on a horizontal coil spring, but with smaller coil springs above and with large road wheels. The idea being they wanted a tank and the, the Centurion was designed first in 1943 as a heavy cruiser. It was about 1945 for they finished it. But they wanted a heavy tank and they said maybe 40, up to 45 tonnes if we could manage it. And they wanted it to be able to move fairly fast, not really fast on roads, which was most people's idea of a fast tank, but fairly fast across country. So they fitted it with these larger diameter wheels so that it would keep up a reasonable pace across country. When they were first produced, they had a, a fairly weak um, mounting for the idler at the front, and you did get incidents of tanks actually breaking their idlers, and well, actually breaking the bracket that held the idler. But um, that, was, that only comes in at the beginning and it soon fades out. The suspension, such as it is, is in three units, and each they're covered by this armour plate skirting. Now, that would seem to have been put up there to keep hollow charge weapons out, or at least to detonate them before they did any real damage. But they found, particularly in Vietnam, that the, um, the suspension, where it was covered by this metal plate, tended to trap a lot of foliage and mud, and they took it off. They ran the tanks without the skirting plate on them, and one or two of the Continental users did that as well. And it, it made, makes the tank look amazingly different with that part moved, but that was fairly common. It has a um, the dry sprocket to the back, as you get with most British tanks, but it's got um, double reduction gearing to the drive sprocket, so it, it uh, gives it a bit more power, that's the answer, to give it a good power weight ratio. That's how the tank was built up. The hull is fairly low. It holds five or uh, four men altogether, the driver at the front and the other three in the turret. But the turret itself is quite remarkable. It's got a cast front, that's containing a 17 pounder in this case, and the rest of the turret is made from rolled steel plate. Now that's only um, featured on the Mark I and the prototypes. It, it does not feature on the Mark II or any scent that came afterwards. They all had cast turrets, but this one has this rolled plate turret. You can tell it at once from the side anyway. On the other side, you can't see it from here, is the ammunition filling slot. It's like a, a, a pistol port in the side of the turret, which is opened and enables a chap to poke in the rounds of ammunition that are being put in when it's being restowed. So that's a feature. The other thing which is almost unique and certainly identifies this vehicle is the 20 millimeter Polston cannon on the side of the main armament. It's totally different to the ordinary machine gun that you'd see there. They found actually from practice that they, the first, what, six or ten of these were fitted with the Polston cannon. And it's a 20 millimetre weapon. It's like a machine gun, a heavy machine gun. It was designed really to um, take out the shields of anti-tank guns. It will penetrate those. So it was quite a useful weapon, but they found 
it took up too much room inside the centurion turret, not just the fact that it's got quite a large breach, but also the ammunition containers for it are quite huge. And by the time they're stowed in the vehicle and then clipped into place, they've taken up a tremendous amount of room. So the Paulson cannon was done away with. It was replaced by a Beza machine gun in the later models, and the Beza machine gun had an optional link to the main gun. So it could be used as a coaxial weapon, but it could be used operationally by itself independently if you wanted to. Um, and later on, they did away with that and they extended the size of the mantlet and put the um, machine gun in coaxially. But in the first one, it's quite different. And it's the Polston cannon in this case that makes it stand out as a, um, a prototype that wasn't fitted to any of the production vehicles at all. The Tank Museum is a registered charity and every purchase you make from our online shop directly supports our work. Here are a few products we think you'll like. We ship worldwide and if you subscribe to our email list, we'll give you 10% off your next order. When you finish this video, go to tankmuseumshop.org and you'll find something you never knew you needed. Now back to the video. In the back is the, um, the Meteor engine, 600 horsepower, the V12, driving to a Merritt Brown transmission system. They selected that engine because it had done so well during the war in the Cromwell and the Comet and so on, then they made quite a, an issue of having a, a, the most powerful engine. It seems to have served this tank very well. Later, slightly more up-to-date marks, slightly more powerful, were put in. But this thing remained using the V12 right to the end, except when they were exported, and the Israelis in particular put diesels in. But um, it, it did pretty well on a petrol engine, considering that a petrol engine will consume a lot more fuel than a diesel and it's more vulnerable in many respects. This particular tank was one of six which was committed to what was known as Operation Sentry. Now that was a sort of idea of sending six tanks to France at the end of the war in 1945 to see how they would fare. Well actually the war was over by the time they arrived and they could only take on hard targets, but they blew most of them away, so they figured that was okay. They also took the opportunity of showing the tank to as many different regiments as possible, so that they knew what they were looking at when it came out. It was much bigger than any tank Britain had produced before. We'd actually given up the idea of making every tank fit on a railway wagon, for instance, so it could be that little bit wider if need be. And this was actually dictated in width which is just over 10 feet, more by the width of the Bailey Bridge that would carry it than by fitting it on a train, that didn't matter anymore. So um, we made some progress, but uh, very slowly, of course, being British. So what we're looking at here is P9, almost certainly the oldest Centurion in existence. It comes before the Mark I, so it's a very old vehicle, and it's worth looking at from that point of view alone. Now, from then on, the Centurion goes on and on, and many marks are produced. It's developed in a number of other ways, as a bridge layer, an armoured recovery vehicle, and so on. And in particular, one of the more obscure variants of the Centurion was the target tank, which we're going to have a look at in another part of the museum. This is a sort of example of the sort of strange things they did. This is a Centurion target tank. To be quite honest, it doesn't look much like a Centurion. In fact, painted this idiotic grey, it doesn't look much like a tank at all. They have stuck a gun in, if you can see it up there. They've stuck a gun, or at least they've stuck the barrel on, which looks like a 17-pounder. So to that extent, it looks like a tank. In fact, they only made three of these. They made them up at Warminster in 27, what was then 27 armoured workshops of Remy and they were made as target tanks so that you could fire um, handheld missiles at them, Carl Gustav, Milan, that sort of thing. And that was the idea, and you fired them with a non-active warhead so that they just struck the thing. It was just to give the infantrymen some idea 
of what it was like to fire at a mobile tank. Now, for that reason, they've covered it in armour. I mean, you could machine gun it and nobody would notice. But it's well plastered with armour. The driver over that side is well shielded from an incoming round, so if anything goes astray, he's perfectly safe. And even the turret is made with thicker armour on so that it will withstand the blows from this. And that's really all. It must have been quite an early century, and I would think probably a Mark II or even a Mark I, maybe. But it's, there were three of them all together, all done up more or less like this. And this one has survived, and that's why we've got it on display, or at least it's in the store here.